that event in 2015 did upset a few people in the establishment. <laughs> <laughs> and it still goes. I love you. Could I just <laughs> say briefly this? First of all, thank you very much, everybody, for being here tonight at this meeting. And uh, I just say this as a founder member of the Stop and Walk Coalition in 2001, and have been a member of the Labour Party a long time, like since before England won the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> peace movements, there's been peace meetings, there's been, C been CND, there's been Labour Action for Peace, there's been many others. There's a whole golden thread tradition running through the Labour Party right back to its foundation at the turn of the 19th and 20th century of those people that look at the world in a way of seeking peace rather than seeking war. And I want us to just recognise that if we go away from that tradition, of um, allowing and giving the space and enabling that serious discussion about peace and alternatives to peace, then we're actually damaging ourselves, denying ourselves that opportunity, and actually doing nothing to oppose what is often a dangerous and headlong rush into wars. And so I just think, thank you for being here tonight, and make sure that um, we don't allow those of us that want to speak out against war rational way to be silenced because we're not going to be silenced because we will always be out speaking up for peace in this world. I would also like to say this, that we founded Stop the War Coalition in 2001 in response to the war in Afghanistan. It wasn't because we thought the abominable event of the attack on the World Trade Center was a good idea. Every single one of us condemned it point we were making was that the occupation of Afghanistan would not bring about a solution to that problem or indeed bring about the likelihood of greater peace in the world. 21 years later, the troops finally left Afghanistan. Billions have been spent. Hundreds of British and American troops have died. Thousands of Afghan troops have died, and tens of thousands of Afghan civilians have died. And what's been left behind is the world's poorest and most uh, desolate nation with a denial of human rights, a denial of the rights of women in the society there, and um, no ability to trade with the rest of the world, and an unbelievable sense of desolation for every person in Afghanistan. That's after 21 years of Western occupation. Surely, those that uh, argue so loudly for that war in 2001 need to just pause for a moment and think about what the consequences of war actually are. Did it make the world a safer place? Did it reduce the terrorist threat? Well, you all know the answer to that as well as I do. And somebody at the back has raised very high, and thank you for so, raise it even higher, you're a tall chap. <laughs> the uh, the uh, poster about freeing Julian Assange. Because, and I want to support that. And I just say this. a lot of the truths and the issues surrounding not just Afghanistan but Iraq, Guantanamo Bay and so much else and I think we should not just thank him for that but also actively support his release and on the 8th of October at 1pm we've asked anyone that can to sign up on the website to be part of a human chain which will completely surround Parliament by crossing the Westminster Bridge then along past uh, St Thomas's Hospital across Lambeth Bridge and back round to Westminster itself as a message that we support Julian Assange and do not think he should be sent to the United States and should not be in a maximum security prison. In fact, should not be in prison at all. Because what he's done... <laughs> the Stop 
Royal Coalition then organized against the um, putative invasion of Iraq, which then, as you well know, happened in 2003, and organized the <coughs> biggest ever demonstration in the history of this country, uh, when all those uh, million and more were in Hyde Park and the more were in the streets all over London that day. And that was a result of um, hundreds of public meetings all over the country, which all of us on this platform and many in this audience either spoke at, attended, or organized those meetings. We built up that huge campaign. And uh, I remember all the pressures in Parliament at the time, enormous pressures on Labour MPs to vote to go to war, and um, a number of us absolutely declined to do that because we felt that it was the wrong thing to do, there was no evidence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and so much of our media were willingly complicit in telling what was a total lie about the situation in Iraq. It wasn't as if any of us had actually supported Saddam Hussein or his regime or the abuse of human rights that he carried out. It's just that we did not think a war with Iraq would solve anything other than, and I quote myself the words uh, I used at the time, and would set off a chain of events that would be more wars, more destruction, more refugees, and more terrorism, and make the world a more unstable place. Where were we wrong on that? And so I wanted to move the dialogue and uh, thought that I would issue an apology on behalf of the Labour Party for that support um, that was given by some to the war in Iraq, and Julie did so. I stand absolutely by that, and I think all of the position that all of us took against the Iraq war has been utterly vindicated. And if you can actually read through all 18 volumes of the Chilcot Report, has anybody here read all 18 volumes? Of it? No, I won't ask that question. It's probably all. Have you? <laughs> I've got them. tell me how many wars are going on in the world at the moment. Oh, you know the answer, you were there. You were there. Yeah, yeah. You knew it anyway. Yeah, Roger, Roger McKenzie of the Morning Star. Get a surprise! Yeah. <laughs> 40, 40 wars that are going on around the world at the present time. Different reasons, different causes, different countries, obviously. Um, but all of them have two things in common. One is, almost always, one side is trying to get hold of the mineral resources or the natural resources of the other. And secondly, the world's arms industries are making a great deal of money out of fueling those conflicts. And so this country allows the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia, knowing full well they're going to be used in the Yemen, knowing full well they're going to lead to the destruction of life and the the narrow spread of cholera and so many other wholly preventable diseases in the world. Okay, there is a ceasefire at the moment, and I hope that ceasefire stays permanent and becomes a permanent settlement there. But don't run away with the idea that selling arms to other countries does not have consequences of the loss of life and the promotion of another war. And so we then move on to the war that's getting the attention, quite reasonably and quite rightly present times, that is the war in Ukraine. And I think we're very grateful to Oliver for his analysis of what um, went on over the negotiations. Because I remember actually asking Liz Truss exactly that question, as I asked Ben Wallace exactly that question. What are you doing to bring about peace negotiations in order to prevent the war, the war from breaking out? Um, they told me they were very keen on peace negotiations. I hope they are, I hope they were, I have doubts, but that's what they said. Um, and uh, we then went into the situation where Russia invaded Ukraine. Now, let's be absolutely clear, and I'll say this slowly, I totally condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Mm. It was not necessary, it was not necessary, it was not necessary. I'm pretty sure everyone in this room will agree with me on, on that. There's no one here that is an apologist for that invasion. But it does mean that we also have to look at how we end that and bring about a peace 
process. And the opportunities for negotiation on many occasions were completely missed. And uh, I think the United Nations has a lot to answer for. Whilst they did get involved, quite rightly, in negotiations to trying to save life during the desperate days in Maripol, they were right to do that. Why on earth couldn't they put the same energies in earlier on to try and prevent the invasion itself and bring about the sort of agreement that would, had got a heads of agreement to it earlier in the year? And I want to see, obviously, an end to the war. And I just simply say this, if it is possible for Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, and the United Nations to come to an agreement to allow grain to be exported from both Russia and the Ukraine, then obviously talking to each other, yeah. then it is perfectly possible to come to at least a ceasefire to look at ways of going forward for the future. Because the alternative is pretty grim, whatever way you look at it. All those um, millions of Ukrainians that have fled to other countries are refugees in those countries, and there's been a great welcome for them, and I've indeed welcomed many Ukrainians to my own constituency, and they're making a fantastic contribution to our society and our community. And I welcome that, and I support them, and I support the good attitude that people have towards them. I just wish our government would have the same attitude towards refugees from the Yemen, from uh, <laughs> And so our plea surely has to be for that, to, for the UN and others to be involved urgently in trying to bring about a ceasefire. Because the alternative is the war will deepen, the war will intensify, and it will go on and on. More and more loss of life, more and more destruction, and more and more profits being made by arms industries in both Russia and in the West as well. And uh, more and more waste of resources into going into these weapons of destruction. So there has to be some other way of doing it. And I think that is the kind of message we're trying to give tonight. Now, I was at an earlier meeting of CND to talk about nuclear weapons. I'm not going to uh, repeat what, what I said uh, earlier. i just add this about what is security. For most people in the world, security is being able to live your own life, to get something to eat, for your kids to go to school, to know you've got a hospital and know you've got a job and that you're breathing relatively clean air and your world is not being destroyed. Sadly, for about 20% of the world's population, that is a completely unrealistic position in that they are short of food, if not desperately hungry, or they're living in deeply polluted conditions and they have a very short life expectancy. And the idea of having access to a doctor or a hospital or anything else is just a pipe dream for so many of them. Look at the response to COVID in the poorest countries in the world. So it is absolutely right that we have a meeting here to call for peace in the war that's going on at the moment in Ukraine, difficult as that is to achieve. It's also right that we start to look at the issues that face our planet. Global warming, environmental destruction, shortages of food for many people, serious problems of air pollution and water pollution which are killing large numbers of children in many parts of the world, or them dying from wholly preventable diseases. Real security isn't the ability to kill your neighbor Real security is to know you can bring up your children in a place of safety. You know, people say, well, that is all completely unrealistic stuff. Sorry, it's there in the Charter of the United Nations, agreed by all the nations of the world and signed up to by every one of those involved in every conflict around the world at the present time. And so the message from this meeting is, yes, we condemn that invasion. Yes, we condemn the killing and the occupation, but we also recognize that it's Russian soldiers that are dying as well. And I absolutely am amazed and support the Russian peace activists that have been so brave, so brave in coming out on the streets to say, this war is not done in our name. This war is not carried out in our name. The same, probably their parents' generation were the same ones who opposed the war in Afghanistan and the Soviet involvement in that, which had such massive consequences for the Soviet Union. 
I want to end this war. I want the UN involved in promoting a peace process. I want to see a relocation and redirection of um, our expenditure and our ingenuity and resources away from increasing the defense, defense budget up to 3% of GDP. Instead, investment in what we need. Not tax giveaways to the super rich, but investment in health, housing, education, and a green industrial revolution to look after, support, defend this planet. Our manifesto of 2019 included all of that and included a um, realignment of our politics and our economy in favour of the many, yes, at the expense of the few. I would argue the way forward for our party, the way forward for our movement, is to understand the importance of those policies and understand the global role we can play to bring about nuclear disarmament, to bring about a more peaceful world and be a voice for peace, not a voice for arms exports and the killing of people in distant lands of which we know sadly not enough. Peace has got to be the only answer. Thank you.